Thank you for the uh, introduction. Now, um, let me start. I will do a PowerPoint presentation because of the vast numbers. And then I will speak as the slides come on. I think this is the best way for mass audiences. Let's start with some uh, riddles. Since we are all going to be teachers, what dog keeps the best time? A watchdog. Okay. Why does a hen lay eggs? Because if she let them drop, they would break. I hope some of you get it right at, at least. Uh, if you're going to be teachers, you will need to know these answers. Huh? They are very important. <laughs> what makes more noise than a cat stuck in a tree? This is a philosophical question. Of course, huh? two cats stuck in a tree. Okay. Um. And what kind of animal has a head like a cat and a tail like a cat, but is not a cat? Let's see who's good in logic. I believe you all graduated from NUS. What kind of animal? Uh, not your tutor, definitely or your lecturer. A tail like a cat, but it's not a cat. Mm. You had me puzzling for some time. A kitten. Now, if you don't have the answers, then you, you will have to learn from your students when you go to school to teach, because they will have the answers. They will have the answers. Okay, children nowadays are much cleverer than adults. Huh? Why does a stock stand on one leg? Because if he took two legs off the ground, he would fall down. Simple. And what is the last thing you take off when you go to bed? Take your feet off, of course. Okay, you take your feet off. All right, now, here are some newspaper cuttings to show you uh, what a big business the teaching of English is. What I did was just to go through the newspaper and just cut a few ads out, current ads. Here is Star Phonics. I'm not uh, related to them at all. And uh, Place, NUSS, Guild House, etc., etc. Okay? So this is on uh, pronunciation. Right? Here also we have things like study abroad. And what are they studying? They're studying about English. Does poor English let you down? Actually, uh, if you just look through the newspaper any day, any time, 
you will see a lot of such ads. Okay? So English is big business. And maybe that's why it's very important to know a little about English if you are going to teach English in the schools. Look at this. Huh? Here again, we have uh, to English tuition, English tuition for secondary K1 to secondary 4 students. Okay, English tuition. And then here, of course, a uh, very famous uh, council, the British Council. All right, it is supposed to be non profit, uh, but they do make a lot of money, especially. <laughs> Uh, you, all you have to do is you go and enroll there, you can see how much they cost. All right, they charge quite a lot of money. And they have all these courses, teaching English to young learners, introduction to teaching English and so forth. So you see, English is big business. Even for MOE, uh, a boost for teaching career with lots of scholarships now. All right, especially, and you know, most of the, teach, or the teachers who come in, they have to teach English. Okay, you have to have a basic requirement of English. Even when you go across the region, okay, to Thailand, for instance, I know that many retirees uh, from the army and so forth, or even retired teachers, they go to Thailand. We know why, lah, huh? but... <laughs> but on paper, on paper, it is because they want to be teachers, because they need teachers. Thailand needs lots of teachers. So here's a retirement job for you, 30 years down the road. I'll be there faster than you. Lah. Okay? Even here, okay, let's say you don't like Thailand, uh, too near, lah. you want to go somewhere else. Okay? okay, then why don't you go to US? Look how desperate they are. The US highest teachers from the third world. Okay? Math, science, English. All right? Look at this. British schools want teachers from Singapore. So British team will come here and they'll come and ask me, uh, Dr. Chu, do you know anyone? Let us know because teachers in shortage in England, all right? So uh, teaching, somehow, there is a big shortage all over the world. It's just like nursing, okay? And of teachers, English also is very, very uh, in demand. But of course... <laughs> of course, huh, if you take a job overseas, you must know why. How come there are so many jobs overseas? You know why, lah? Because teaching has become a more dangerous occupation than the army. <laughs> okay, now uh, after the introduction, which I devised for the latecomers who are still coming in, we now must start on something more serious. So please, no more laughing. The first part is on history and spread. So I'll be giving you a history lesson. I'm sorry, I apologize first. Huh? History lesson. You know what history lessons are like. And uh, the first part is history lesson, the first hour. And the second hour will be on linguistic theory. Another thing which, which is also quite heavy going, which is on theory. So let's start with history. Let's start with history. Okay, the history of English. To put you in the mood so that when you take English, you kind of know what you're in for. Let me just uh, quote. Huh? Today, English is used by at least 750 million people. Uh, I think now it will have reached uh, 1 billion, because this book was some time ago. And barely half of those speak it as a mother tongue. Okay? Now, barely half of those speak it as a mother tongue. This is very unusual. Whatever the total, at the end of the 20th century, it is more widely scattered, more widely spoken. It has become the language of the planet, the first truly global language. Okay? So maybe that's why we are studying English. Now, English as a lingua franca. This is something very common. Sanskrit was a lingua franca. French was a lingua franca. Arabic was a lingua franca, so what? Okay. But the thing is this, huh, as you can see it in the, second, in the second part, half of those speak it as mother tongue. This is something that has never happened before. That more than half of the people who speak English do not speak it as a mother tongue. 
You see? So in other words, there are more non-native speakers of English than there are native speakers. Now, this has never happened before in linguistic history. Lingua francas, there have always been, and there will always be. Okay? But for the first time, we have a very unusual phenomenon. We never had a lingua franca where the non-native speakers overpower that of the native speakers. What are we going to do? How does it affect us? How does it impact us? What does it mean in terms of, you know, control of the language? Why then does, do we, you know, uh, why then does the control of the language lies in the West, in England or the British Council? If, if there are more, than, more, than, more non-native speakers than native speakers, why are the majority led by a minority? So these are the questions that are unique for this century. They are very, very unique because it's never happened before. Now, the next one. English is a language, the language on which the sun does not set, whose users never sleep, as you know. It's all over the place. Some people say, hey, one billion, nothing great. What about Mandarin? Hey, Mandarin got 1.2 billion, you know. So English is not the main thing, yes? But Mandarin, where are the majority of the speakers? They are in China. You see? And the majority of the speakers are native speakers. So even though you may have more than one billion, in terms of the influence, okay, in terms of the impact on the world, it's very, very much less. And that is why, you know, you, you're coming here for this content upgrading class on English. You know of the Speak Good English movement. It is very important that we speak and we write English well because, because of these statistics. Okay, because this is the language that will give us the competitive edge okay, in anything that we do. And especially if we are going into biotech, into financial center, where the level of English that is needed is a very high level. It's not just a, like a market level you can get along. Okay, the level of English that we need to go into such fields, you know, uh, we need to be very, very competent in English. Okay, let's go into the history and spread of English and give you the context. And then later we'll go into the theory. I'm going to answer three questions. Where did English come from? What did it look like earlier? And what have been the major influences? You have your notes, so if you want to take, take down some uh, notes, you're free to do so. If you don't have your notes, please uh, try to get it. And the notes is a summary of today's lecture. There are only two sides. Okay, there are only two sides. Okay. So we do the first side in the first hour and the second side in the second hour. Okay, these are scripts. Okay, I just give you the world view. Huh? We had the Karada script, we have the Chinese script. This is the Arabic script. And now we go into English, okay? Five major linguistic influence on English. And you can see from your notes here, yeah? so that you can. There are lots of uh, linguistic influence on English. Okay. The first is the Celtic influence. Celtic. Okay, the Celts. This is the pre-English period. No? That means English was not spoken. The vernacular of the British Isles was not English. It was actually Celtic. Okay, it was actually Celtic. And the Celts came from probably Belgium or some of the Europeans, you know, the northern European states, and they probably migrated to England. Then we had Latin. Okay, then we have Latin. Latin came because Rome, the Roman Empire, invaded Britain. And so Britain was under the Romans, okay, for about a few hundred years. Okay, that was about the first century AD. Now, when the Romans went to England, the language, the official language, like in Singapore, our official language is English, Tamil, Mandarin. So in England, the official language at the time of the Romans was Latin. Latin is very important because the English language, as an inflectional language, 
takes a lot from Latin because Latin is also inflectional language. We'll do that later in the second half. What is the meaning of inflection and so forth? Okay? So that's Latin. So for 500 years, Latin was spoken. That's why we have Latin mass, you know, and we have lots of textbooks on Latin. Why universities such as Oxford and Cambridge, they have Latin departments. Why, if you read novels written uh, two, three hundred years ago by the uh, great English writers, you know, they always refer to Latin because, because of the past. And then we have Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon is from Germany, lots of migration to England. So we find that German is a cousin, cousin, linguistic cousin of English. Okay? So if you are German, you can learn English quite easily because we are cousins. Just like if you are Tagalog, Filipino. You can learn Malay quite well because they are cousins. They are cousins, Polynesian languages. Huh? They are cousins. We are uh, Korean. You can learn Japanese quite well because you are cousins. You are related. Right? So this is Anglo-Saxon. And then now we go to Scandinavian. These are the influences. Remember uh, from Norway, okay, the Vikings. They also settled in England. And then we have the French. So all these Celtic, Latin, Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, French, they will influence the English language. That's why we are studying the history. Many of the words in English come from, 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 from these uh, influences. You can, trace, you can trace them. And the French, because the French conquered England also for a few hundred years, about from from about 1100 to about uh, 1500, roughly. Okay, a few hundred years. Britain was under the French. Okay, and therefore, a lot of words in England, in English, is derived from French. <coughs> and that's why until today, because they were of this history, the British and the French, they don't really um, <laughs> see eye to eye on many things because of this uh, rivalry, you know, this national rivalry. Okay, so here's some pictures that I got for you so that you can picture it a little better so you won't fall asleep so quickly for your history lesson. These are like the Celtics. Huh? Nature of evidence. Now, in order to talk about history, there are two kinds of evidence. One is internal. Internal means we get the evidence from the language itself. Okay? We look at the language. And we can trace its history. Wow, the English language has French words. Oh, we look back. No wonder, because they were conquered by France. Oh, the English has uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon words. No wonder, because a lot of Anglo-Saxon from Germany migrated to England. Well, the English language sounds like Latin, you know, in terms of its grammar, it's very Latin. Yeah, no wonder, because the Romans, the Romans conquered Britain. So this is known as internal evidence. It means you look at the language itself and you try to find clues so that you can construct a history of the language. Now, what about external? Now, external means non-linguistics. It means don't look at the language. Let's look at something else. Let's look at uh, the social developments, the political developments the economic developments. Don't look at the language. Let's look at something else so that we can construct the history. Now, in my lecture, I will do both. I will do both so as to be balanced. Okay. Now, I give you some data here and you can see uh, the English language in relation to Latin. To Latin. Okay. Okay. So, nominative, accusative, genitive, dative. This is the Latin system. So that's why in English, we have the words like this. Subject, object, and then here genitive, of the Lord, to the Lord, so forth. Look at this again. He is nominative, at it. I add him, him is accusative. I add his apple is genitive, and dative, I gave the apple to him. Now you'll be doing grammar. <coughs> you'll be doing grammar the next three days, I know. Don't worry, they're not going to teach you Latin. Huh? But you will kind of understand how come the English language has this structure because they borrow, borrowed it from Latin. Okay? 
You know that the Europeans, they admire the, the Greeks and the Romans, right? They do admire them. Most of their literature, you know, they, all the ideas of their literature, all they stole from the Greeks and the Romans. Look at Shakespeare's work, for instance. All right? They always look to the Greeks and the Romans. So Latin was their language. Okay, and so their, their language was influenced by Latin, which is a much older language than English. Okay, and that's why it has all this uh, case. This is known as case, nominative, accusative, genitive. These are known as case. That's why it's very difficult to study English because of this structure, this Latinate structure. If you study Mandarin, Mandarin is so easy, right? It doesn't have all these cases. Very easy to study Mandarin. Same like Malay. Malay is very easy to study. But English, look at all this, it takes a lifetime to master. It's very abstract. You have to do a lot of acrobatics in your head in order to have the, a, a nice sentence. Okay? Mandarin is much easier, much simpler the grammar. So the good news is, if you are going to be English teachers, I think you will have a job for life. <laughs> okay? Because the grammar is so... There's a lot to do in the grammar. And students take years and years and years to master it. And they still make mistakes. So good. I'll see you working until 80. Okay, here are internal evidences. Internal evidences, we are like linguists. We go to a certain place and we collect information of how a certain word like such is pronounced. We collect information with a tape recorder. We collect. And we find that in this part of England, it is sitch, and then sitch, and then switch, and then such, and then hoshosh, and then switch. And then we can make a linguistic chart of the movement of uh, the language, you know, how the language changed to which region, and so forth. Okay, so this is internal evidence. Now, this is now external evidence. I told you that I will do both. External evidence, we look at history in a wider context. Okay, the role of King Alfred, for instance. Okay, the role of King Alfred. King Alfred is important, one of the early kings. About a long time ago, huh? about 800, 900 years ago. And he is important because he translated the Latin text into the West Saxon dialect of Old English. That's how English came along with King Alfred. You see, it was usually Latin or French. English was just a dialect, you know. English is like Hokkien or Cantonese, you know. It's a dialect, okay? It's not important. If you want to be somebody, you should speak Latin or you should speak French. But then we have this English king. King Alfred, okay, who says that, no, we will now try to speak English. So let's translate all the Latin texts into English because Latin was, the, was all the learned texts because, you know, England at that country was all like a farming, a, 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 a agrarian agriculture. So the place of learning would be from Rome and Greek, Greece. I told you they looked towards them. Okay? And he was the king who brought about standardization. So, linguists, they will have heard of King Alfred. Okay, but not King Arthur. <laughs> King Arthur is for the Camelot, right? And, uh, <laughs> do you know the story of King Arthur? Okay, the public, they will know the story of King Arthur because he's associated with Camelot and so forth. Okay? And I remember in Camelot, there was also Lancelot, right? I remember Lancelot is from France. Remember? And King Arthur's wife, Genevieve, fell in love with... A Frenchman, okay, a uh, Lancelot, because he was so romantic and he had such beautiful phrases because French is much older language than English, okay? And so you can see, therefore, again, the rivalry between French and English. But Alfred was the king who promoted the English language, okay? So now, we have now here the Norman Conquest. Norman is from Normandy. Those of you who study history, you probably know about the Normandy invasion, the Second World War. Okay, but we're not so interested in that. We're more interested in about 1,000 years back, where the French conquered England. And as a result, French 
became the language of honour, chivalry and justice. And, and that's why the story in Camelot goes that, uh, you know, uh, Queen Genevieve would, would fall in love with Lancelot rather than with Arthur. Because Arthur was an Englishman. And you know what Englishmen are? Compared to French men, okay? So this was the language of honour, chivalry and justice. All right. So French became the language of the court for bureau bureaucracy purposes and so forth. If you're someone learned, you would know French. So even today, the second language, they would go and learn French in England. Okay? The language of culture, of the arts and so forth. All right, so here is the English origins, one more uh, in, in map form, can you see? The Anglo-Saxons and all this, this is how they migrate, and this one also from Scotland, and uh, coming down here. Some of the old maps. All right, can you see from the Latin, from Rome? Latin from Rome, and they go here, and they go to London. Okay, so you can see again the competition between London and Paris or the competition between English and French. Okay. Because England is an island, whereas here, France, huh, is part of the continent. Okay. So again, very interesting, isn't it? So islands, islanders, huh, islanders usually <laughs> are quite different from mainlanders. Okay. So there's always a rivalry there. It's just like Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, China, you look at the, the psyche of the islanders, huh? they're usually more assertive, more, more aggressive. Okay, so their language, uh, there was a competition of the language, but all of them had their initial influence from Rome. Okay, through Latin. Okay, let's look at some early English manuscript. I told you it's a history lesson. Huh? Now, here are pre-English here. These are the dates I have uh, divided up for you. So, all you need to do is to get an idea, okay, of the development of the English language. Since the topic of this lecture is called the history of English. Okay, here is a picture of the, the cover of a coffin. Because that's the only place where we can get inscriptions of Old English. You know, because when people die, they spend a lot of money trying to make the coffin look nice, especially if the person is a nobleman or king or something like that. And you can see here in the 8th century, very runic characters. Look at my arrow. Very runic characters. And this is an example of Old English. See, I've uh, got, I put it down here for you. You can recognize some of the letters like P. F will have changed already. Can you see R is still the same? M, M we, you know, this part will go down a little bit more. N, look at N, very different. You see? So the historian of the langu of language huh, will go into all this. They will compare all manuscripts and then they will date the manuscripts and then they will see how the language evolved and changed into what we're learning today. Oh, uh, this was how they look at that time. <laughs> okay? Of course, you know, during the same time that we're talking about, uh, 8th and 9th century, the Arab world was already very, very uh, advanced. Okay? The Omayyads, the Abbasids, you know, they were the world of science at that time. Okay, that's why I say uh, English language uh, causes a lot of resentment. Now you know why. Because they are a parvenu. You know what's a parvenu? Uh, French. Uh, means uh, what? You're a newcomer. You newcomer, hey, look at my language, I Sanskrit, you know, in how many years? Arabic, you know. We, we, were, we were doing signs, you know, like this. Huh? We were doing signs when you were, <laughs> when you were in the cave. Can you see now the resentment? It is like, hey, your language was just a dialect. You did Latin. You did French, and then suddenly you have English, and suddenly English is all over the world. Suddenly we are all learning English. Suddenly someone like me, who is Chinese in origin, is, 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 is not teaching you about Chinese, you know. It's standing here teaching you about English. Okay, let's go back to manuscript. Huh? Sometimes I bring in some commentary to make it, 
to give you a wider context. Because when you have the context, you can understand quite a lot of things. And then it becomes interesting and real for you. So here, again, uh, the old English, quite different. You can see there's no spacing. No spacing. Spacing only comes much later. Look at this. No spacing, no punctuation. Very good, no? so you don't have to make punctuation mistakes. <laughs> uh, right. And look at this, 10.45. Okay, uh, look at this. I, I highlight this for you. At first, the G uh, was not closed up. But now, you see, at first it was not closed. Now it's closed, you see. So language evolved. These are the internal evidence. Internal evidence means looking at the scripts themselves and seeing what, what are the changes. Okay? These are the old books. Can you see they are very rare, very precious. And the old books are all written by hand. Here, 15th century. Now you have spacing. Look at the spacing. You've got spacing. Now you have uppercase and lowercase. Huh? Can you see uppercase and lowercase? Before that, there was no uppercase and lowercase. All right. So this is actually from Chaucer. Chaucer. If you go to the university and read literature, usually they will ask you to learn Chaucer. And they're very proud of Chaucer because he wrote in Old English. Can you see or not? So it's like a good evidence of uh, English. Okay, this is the Canterbury Tales from Chaucer. And this is uh, how they wrote uh, their manuscript. Okay, they wrote their manuscript. This uh, usually is a scribe, and they would be in the scriptorium. This is the place where they write. And they would take maybe one year to write out a book. That's why books are very, very expensive. Okay, and the book's very, very precious. Okay, and the book is actually the real uh, treasure. Okay. Contrast this with today, when we live in the information age, right? When books are so cheap, you know, people give you free. All the junk mail that you receive, one day can be like a book, a stack of a book. All right? Now, this is the, the time, uh, that, that was the time. Scribes, huh? Usually it was the, the monks, the monks. The monks were usually the scribes. They were the ones who were literate. People like you and me, we were all illiterate because we were probably be working on the farm, okay, or selling something in a little shop or something like that. So all the literate people were the monks. And that's why the early literacy text was usually the Bible. Okay, okay here again, close up of his work. So there were things like scribes. Okay, let's look at some handwriting samples. Since we're doing history, Let's see how handwriting has changed. This is George Washington, his handwriting. Nowadays, we don't write like this anymore. Hmm? And in fact, we are now on the verge of great changes, you know, because handwriting is like nothing nowadays. Because most of us, we type. We type, okay? Uh, but handwriting is important because actually, you know, someone who was writing the history of uh, men's, uh, of humankind's uh, hu uh, evolution, they said there were three, three stages where there was a gigantic leap, you know, in, uh, in the fortunes of, of the world. The first was when we learned to write like this, when we learned to write. Because when you learn to write, it means that you can communicate with someone without having to be next to the person. Because the courier can carry it for you, the, the letters and so forth. And you learn to write. And then you can transmit what you know to the next generation. So that was the first giant leap. Okay? And they said that the second giant leap was the invention of the printing press. Because then, you don't have to take one year to write a book or you have to take one whole day to write a letter or whatever it is. You, know? you can just print. And that was by William Caxton. Later we'll go into that, the printing press. And do you know what the third great leap is? We are all living today. We're living right now. We, we don't realize it, you know? That means it's going to change the world drastically. It's going to change the world drastically. We're living in a period of great changes. It's no longer the invention of, handwrite, of, of writing, no longer the invention of printing. It is the, 
the computer, the computer, the broadband, isn't it? The broadband, the internet. That's going to change everything. It's going to change the way we write. It's going to change our grammar. Okay? It's going to change the way we read. It's going to change the way we organize our text. We are right now in this age, and but we can't see it because we are inside. We are inside it. So if you look at the vista of the history of the language, you can see this millennium points. You can see these exile periods, okay, where great changes come into being. Okay, here are some handwritings, uh, red ink. They usually make from some beetle nut, or like you know. Okay, uh, different font size. Look, uh, Marie Antoinette thought this was interesting. Just in case you like to know how she wrote, this was how she wrote. And you can't write like this anymore. Can't write like this anymore. Huh? It's a different style, different fashion. Uh, look at Napoleon Bonaparte. His writing. Uh, this letter uh, is in a museum because it was intercepted, you know, when he wrote a letter. Uh, and he sent it by courier. And the courier was intercepted. Courier went on horseback. And it was intercepted. And so the letter fell into uh, Nelson's hand. And so the letter is now in the British Museum. <laughs> and that's why we're looking at it now. Because we are studying the English language. Okay. All right, handwriting by Gandhi, 1914. All right, handwriting by Gandhi. Uh, this is, of course, Arabic uh, script, uh, just to show the difference. Now, let's go now to modernity. The Renaissance and the English language. All right, 15th century. We slowly make our way to the present. Okay, okay modernity is, we can date it from the 15th century. Because that was the time of the Renaissance. The Renaissance. Okay, I'm following the historical interpretation of mod modernity. We are supposed to be living in the postmodern period, no longer modern, you know. At that time in the 15th century, they were saying modern, uh, modernity already. So if you think you're modern, think again. Okay? And um, why was it modern? Let me tell you why they felt that 15th century was modern. First, there was an intellectual outlook. You know, people began to get curious, the Renaissance, get curious. Okay? There was a growth of capitalism. Remember the East India Company, they came, Vasco da Gama and all this, they came to, to, to this part of the world and so forth. There was a growth of capitalism. Okay? People began to look for, into education. The gentry began to send their children to be educated. So people wanted to know more about language. So, uh, the Renaissance. Huh? So now, what happens to the English language? Okay, what happens to the English language now? English language will definitely be affected. Okay, with the Renaissance. Now, this is, this is what happened to the English language with the Renaissance. Four things. One is selection. That means they now wanted to choose a standard language. This happened in England huh, at that time, 15th, 16th century. Because you saw that map just now. Different parts of England pronounce words differently. So which one shall be the standard? So they decided, we must choose a standard because people are now interested to learn language. And with language, they go to school, and then they can discover about science. And then they can write business letters and go into capitalism and, you know, try to make money, industrial age and so forth. All right? So selection. And of course, what was selected was the language of Southwest, uh, Southeast England. Southeast England. You know where the, you know where London is? London is, okay? So where the royalty lives. So they selected that dialect, Southeast dialect, as the standard. So let's say you happen to be somewhere else in the west or in the north, then sorry, that's not the standard. So if you go to school, you have to learn the standard. 
Okay, you have to learn the, the Southwest dialect. Uh, sorry, Southeast dialect. Southeast dialect. You have to learn that, that standard. Okay? Then they have to codify. Okay, codify means to standardize the spelling. People are spelling all kinds of ways. Okay, they have to standardize. They have to write grammar books. This is when your grammar books come into being. Okay, this period, this period. So grammar is a very old subject. Can date it from this period. Then they have to elaborate. Elaborate means new vocabulary. As you make new discoveries, you have new words. Just like with the computer revolution, you have a lot of new words associated with the computer which was not here 10 years ago. Okay, so that was a period when you know, there were lots of discoveries and so forth. So there were lots of new words. And of course, implementation. You have to implement the text. You have to learn it. So it, be it became uh, systematized. So this was the period. So they started it long ago. Okay? They started it long ago. For many new nations like Singapore, for instance, huh, we have to start it in the 20th century. We have to select a language from all the races. Say which is the standard, okay? Codify it, elaborate on it, implement it in school, okay? But in Europe and in England, it started very long ago, about 500 years ago. This process started 500 years ago. This is an important person. His name is Caxton. His was the second revolution. Remember I told you there were three, okay? Where language was concerned, there are three revolutions. This is the second. Okay, he started printing materials in English. Okay. So when you begin to print materials in English, a lot of the language can grow. Because a lot of, as you read, you improve your language. As you read, you are able to write. Writing is a mirror, is a mirror of reading. Okay. So printing came into being. And uh, here is a printing press. I got this uh, from the history book huh, on language. So here is a printing press. Uh, the early printers, quite different from today, right? With your word processor and your word editor, very different. Okay? All right, this is the first book printed by Caxton, the historic book. And when you print a book, it means you print 10,000 copies, 20,000 copies. It means people can read. It means it's cheap. Instead of a book costing $10,000, now your book only costs $10 because of printing. So there become mass literacy. Mass literacy. Okay? Okay, here just to show you, huh? Japanese uh, wood, wood block making, huh? quite different. Okay, typefaces. Printing, they develop typefaces. I'm, I don't think you've seen this, but I have seen this. I remember that when I was a schoolgirl, I was in charge of printing our school annual. So I had to go and see the printer. And I remembered going to the printer's shop, and I saw he had all these things. That was in the 60s, you know. And he had all these things. So actually, my generation lived to see the age of Caxton, and the modern age, you know, the age of computer, where printing is done by computers. Okay, because I remember seeing all this when I visited the printer in trying to print the screw annual for my school. I remember seeing all this, okay, in the printer shop. And I remember seeing this also at the printer shop. There were a lot of typefaces, and they would take one and take one. You take a tweezer and take one and take one, you know, and then you, you, you make it into a block. It's very laborious. Okay? Just, just to show you the printing going back. Yeah. I remember this. I remember this in the 60s and the 70s. I remember this. And you go and print your book. They would have this. Now don't have already. A typesetter is now uh, obsolete. Now you don't have a job as typesetter anymore. No, no such jobs anymore. Ah, I remember this. You know? The shop has a lot of cases where they have all the different types of prints. I remember this. Okay, let's get back to history. Renaissance, Henry VIII. Showed you this picture so that you can get back to the period.
Renaissance, Shakespeare. This is the period we're talking about. Okay. And now we go to the Reformation. Okay. Now this is the period. Now, the Reformation, 16th, 17th century, Uh, when you say reformation, what do you mean? It means reform, right? From the root word, reform. Reform from what? Reformation. This is the period of the breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. Because remember, Britain was very influenced by Latin and Rome. They always looked up to Rome. But you saw the picture of Henry VIII just now. Right? And you, you know the famous story eh, where he, he wanted to marry another wife, right? And so he had to break away from the Catholic Church because the Pope says that you're not supposed to marry another wife, okay, in the Catholic faith. So he says, okay, then I'll form the Anglican Church. So this was the period of Reformation where they feel that it was to reform, to reform the Church, okay? And, and during this period was the rise of science. This was the rise of science during this period. So it, it took place at the same time. This was the period of Galileo. Okay, this was the period of Galileo. This was the period of Copernicus. Remember the fight between Copernicus and the Pope over whether the earth revolves, was the center of the universe or whether the, the sun was the center of the universe and there was a big fight. This was that period. Now, what's the re relevance of all this to English? I'll tell you why. Because there was another scientist Besides Galileo and Copernicus, yeah, there was another scientist in England. And his name was Newton, Isaac Newton. Okay? And, for, and because the church at that time was persecuting all the scientists, because they were saying things that was opposite to the doctrine of the church, okay? so they were censoring their works. Now, Newton, therefore, did not publish his work in Latin which was, at that time, all the scientific works were published in Latin. He published in English because Caxton was able to publish his works for him. So Newton published his famous optics, you know, his, his work, optics, was published in English. Now, when you have a great scientist publishing in English, you know what it means or not? It means that anyone who wants to learn science has to learn English. That's what it means. It's just like today. When the latest works in science are published in scientific journals, not in French, not in German, not in Japanese, but in English, okay? The latest works in science, in biotechnology, in nanotechnology, okay? In all the latest uh, cutting-edge subjects, what does it mean? It means that if you want to be at the frontier of knowledge, you have to learn English. So when the scientists publish in that language, it becomes very significant. You see? So now we have this Newton publishing in English. All right? And we have Royal Society. At that time, that was the journal, the Royal Society. That's for the sci scientists. It was all in English. Okay? Before that, it was in Latin. You see? So now, people begin to publish things published science in English. So as a result, English began to be popular. It began to be in demand. You see, uh, let me just sidetrack a bit, just to explain this significant point. You know, before the Second World War, English wasn't as uh, popular as today. Because the language of science before the Second World War was German. German. So if you wanted to be a top scientist, you have to learn German. If you want to be at the cutting edge of anything, you have to learn German. Right? But because of the Nazi persecution of the Jews, and it so happened that many of the Jews were the top scientists in Germany. <laughs> what happened to some of the Jews? They all ran away to? They ran away where? They ran away because of the persecution, ran away to America. And as a result, the language of science 
shifted from German to English. You see? You see, so sometimes through external evidence, history, the, the, the language history is affected by external factors beyond its control. Okay? So that is why after the Second World War, anyone who wanted to be a real top scientist, you have to learn English. You can't wait for the translation. If you wait for the translation, it will be take another one, two years. By which time, that's no longer the cutting edge, my friend. If you want to know where the cutting edge is, you have to attend the top conferences, which are all in English. You have to read the top journals. The minute it comes out, oh, that's the cutting edge. So in order for me to, you know, to do even greater things, I must push the edge. I must push the edge. That's how you win the Nobel Prize. You push the edge. But in order to win that prize, you must know where the edge is. Right? If you're going to wait for interpretation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it'll take too long. Because by the time you interpret, uh, some, something else has been discovered already. Okay, so this, 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 is what is, this is the meaning of the world language. Okay, this is the place of English today. Okay, so the government is trying to spend a lot of money to, you know, to, to have really good uh, English teachers and to increase, you know, improve the standard of English. And of course, standardization. I told you this already. Okay, we are coming to the, almost the end of history. And then, this is 18th century, the Reformation. This is like our Starbucks in the 18th century. They would meet at their Starbucks, which is a coffee house. And they will discuss the latest inventions in science or the latest things happening in the world, the latest business, okay? the latest uh, colonial expansion, all the news they will exchange, all the gossip they will exchange in the coffee house. See, so these are the people. See, that's how they discuss things there. That was the time. Okay? This was the period of uh, great growth in Western medicine. These are surgeons, okay? All right, and the language, okay, shifted from Latin to English. Okay, it shifted because Latin used to be the language of medicine. So if you want to be a doctor, you have to learn Latin. Okay, but because of the, as I told you, the persecution of the church against the scientists in Italy, so then they have to shift to English, you see. All right, all right, and now we go to the last section for history. The colonial experience, which will bring us up to the 20th century, which lasted from 1603 to 1952. Okay? And this is the world we are living in today as a result of, of all that has happened. Okay? We have nationalism, okay? the reasons behind colonialism. You know, huh? God, just to summarize, God. They, they went because of God you know, to spread their religion, of greed to get money and to get all the spices and the tea and all this, and glory, all right? To summarize it very succinctly, God, greed, and glory. So they expanded, but when they expanded, what happened? They spread their language, and that's why English, because of the colonial expansion, you know, became the language in many, many parts all over the world. Same like French, same like Dutch. If we look around us, the Dutch was in Indonesia, the French was in Indochina, the British was in Burma, in Malaysia, in Singapore, the Americans was in Philippines, just looking around us. Huh? And this was the same throughout many parts of the world. And the colonial masters bring their language for the common people. Now, Britain, Okay, uh, by some fluke or other, it managed to have a lot of territories, much more than the French and the Belgium, uh, you know, uh, uh, much more than Germany and so forth. So, by some lucky, lucky stroke, uh, it, uh, a lot of people spoke English, a lot of colonies spoke English. Okay, so that's why, uh, that's the reason why I'm learning English today. Not only that, see the other reason here? 
there was also Australia. Migration to Australia, or sending the convicts okay, to Australia. New Zealand, Canada, all these are first language speaking countries for English. Okay, it's Australia, New Zealand, Canada. South Africa, yes. These are some migration or just sending out all the, the people who had no jobs, they all went, went to these places. Okay? So the language spread all over the world because of the colonial experience. West Africa. Okay, this is through uh, slavery. Slavery. So a lot of, uh, because of the slave trade, Oops. All right. And then, of course, U.S. All right. U.S. also spoke English. Again, because of migration and then the American Civil War. And then they broke away from England. They also spoke English. Okay. And then pigeons and creoles. Pigeons and creoles are like Papua New Guinea, Sierra Leone, Guyana, Suriname. Okay. All these are pigeons and creoles. Hawaii, okay, where you get, uh, you go and get some slaves during the slave trade nah, from, uh, from the West African coast. And then they, they come from all different areas. And because they come from all different areas, they don't speak the same African language. So they, you put them into the ship for many months. Of course, many of them will die on the journey. And they have to talk to each other, right? But I can't understand you. You can't understand me because I come from this part of Africa. You come from that part of Africa. And so we will try to uh, say something. And so that becomes a pigeon. Can you see or not? We're trying to say something. Also, we have all the different slaves working in the same plantation. You come from this part, I come from this part. And so it becomes, a pigeon develops. And their children, the, the children of the slaves, will speak Creole. Creole, Creole is more developed, a more developed kind of language from the pigeon. So these are the variations, huh? the variations. Okay, so that's colonial. So this is India, the British in India. So quite a lot of people in India speak English, and they speak it very well. All right? They speak it very well. Okay, because of the colonial experience. Here are the slave, slave plantations where they have to speak a variety of English in order to communicate with the slaves. You see the, the white master and the slaves. Here is an original uh, document of uh, to be sold, a cargo of 94 prime healthy Negroes, comprising 39 men, 15 boys, 24 women, and 16 girls. I don't know how they know. Huh? They must have examined them. Just arrived. Okay, so this was how English spread, also slave trade. And of course, the, the, the captured people will have to learn some English. But their English will be very pigeon-like. Okay, and then of course, uh, this is the end slide, which is the atomic bomb. And then the world changed again, isn't it? This is the, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. Okay, and then when the world changed again, this is after the war, uh, we come to the end of our session. Not so bad, huh? History. <laughs> so after this, it will be theory.